Hello folks, and, and welcome to uh, our talk on To Extinction and Beyond, the Xerxes Blue and California Condor. I just wanted to say that um, I'm sorry that I can't be doing this in person. I was looking forward to it. I, I did a little um, walk through the natural history collection upstairs at the museum uh, as part of the preparation. And I was looking forward to, to meeting and greeting and chatting with people and talking about biodiversity both at California and, and in Orkney and this, this this is this is still a way of being able to connect and to to provide the presentation but this was not my first choice um, I'm afraid that's what we're stuck with so I did do a talk for the Orkney Natural History Society on biodiversity when I was working on Ecuador uh, that was about 20 years ago so it's, it's nice to be back. I do need to do a little bit of an explanation as to why these two species are the subject of our talk. So one of the classes that I currently teach is for University of California, Berkeley. It's a post-baccalaureate class for pre-medical students. So those are students that, that wish to become doctors, but their bachelor's degree is in something quite different. Um, for example, in history of art or in, I don't know, um, Inca pottery. But they need to get their uh, prerequisites to, to start their medical careers. So with these students, I like to find a, a way of connecting them to provide a hook for them to be able to, to get to grips with nature. And the way I do that is by finding stories that are bo both relatable and local. And one of the stories I have been using in the classroom for years is the Xerxes Blue story. As it turns out that last year, so July 2021, there was a, a new scientific paper published on the topic of museomics, uh, published in the biology letters of the Royal Society. And, and that started me on a quest to, to learn more about the Xerxes Blue and actually to, to see them. So the California Academy of Sciences, based in San Francisco, has the world's largest collection of specimens of the Xerxes Blue. And that's something I wanted to, to see, to, to put my eyes on, to be able to connect to, to this species and then better understand the story. Uh, I sent an email to the Academy of Sciences asking for, you know, an opportunity to see the collection and, and I got no reply. Uh, later on, I had been invited to, to make a talk at the Astronomers Museum and I emailed with a link embedded of the Astronomers Museum and the Orkney Natural History Society and I got an immediate response. Turns out that Chris Grinter, the curator of entomology, was himself making a trip to Orkney in June 2022. So it was a, a nice kind of connection between the two of us. Then for the Condor, um, 2021, we decided not to make the trip to Orkney, but to, to do local trips instead, one of which was a camping trip to Pinnacles National Park. It's about two, two and a half hours from our house. My son and I went camping and our goal was to see wild flying California condors. So, so we were fortunate that we were able to see them uh, both days that we were there. Then later in the summer, we did a longer family trip north up the coast to Redwood National Park. And it turns out that as we passed through uh, Northern California, we traveled through Yurok country. So Yurok is one of the native Californian tribes. And they have this, this long um, history, this tradition, if you like, folklore based upon the California condor. And they themselves have been instrumental in developing a program that has led to the reintroduction of California condors to their territory. And, and that was last month, so May 2022. So our top left here, this is an image of the now extinct Xerxes Blue Butterfly from the California Academy of Sciences. 
And then for a local perspective on the right, so here we have a Polymatis Icarus, which is uh, the common blue, which I saw flying around Stromness about a week ago. It's also in our, our collection here of the Natural History Society. So it seems perhaps that the, the butterfly itself has inspired something of the classicist in the taxonomist. So Glauco Psyche Xerxes is in the Lysenidae, the family of blue butterflies. So the species name Xerxes is derived from a Persian warrior king, and even Psyche, part of the genus name, refers to the Greek goddess of the soul. Uh, and even the common blue, the species name is Icarus, which brings to mind, you know, one of the uh, iconic um, images of a flight of fancy. So the Xerxes Blue inhabited the coastal sand dunes of the Sunset District of Western San Francisco. It is of note because it was perceived as being the first American butterfly to become extinct. And that was directly due to the urban development um, as San Francisco expanded to the west and took over the habitat, the sand, sandy soils derived from sand dunes. Um, and after I had my meeting at the California Academy of Sciences, I, I wanted to go and see Lobos Creek where the last specimen was collected. So this is a little clip from that one trip. I'm here at the Lobo Creek Valley Trail in the Presidio of San Francisco. These sand dunes, the sandy soils formed from former sand dunes, this was the habitat of the Xerxes blue butterfly. In fact, this plant here in the foreground, this is deerweed, Atmospon glabber. So this was the host plant of the Xerxes blue butterfly. The last specimen of Xerxes Blue was collected on March 23rd, 1943 by Harry Lang at Lobos Creek in the Presidio in San Francisco. Years later, after it became obvious that the species had gone extinct, Harry Lang was asked in an interview of, of his, his perspective. What he ended up with was this very short and poignant statement. I always thought there would be more. I was wrong. So when I was in the California Academy of Sciences, I was, I was looking through three trays of specimens. And in one of the trays was inserted this little typed note. And it simply stated, there is a little likelihood it will ever appear again. So this is the one of the images from the species page on, on Wikipedia. So all Wikipedia um, species pages have a conservation status. This is derived from the IUCN, International Union for Conservation of Nature, the red list. So here are the conservation st statuses. On the left, we have extinct. Then we have EW that is extinct in the wild. And then we have species that are, are not extinct, but we have critically endangered, endangered and vulnerable. So once the Xerxes blue was recognized as being extinct, the scientists could agree um, that it was a loss for biodiversity. There always remained uh, a doubt so opinion was divided over whether Xerxes blue was its own species. The alternate interpretation was that it was a subspecies of uh, a more widespread butterfly that's still in existence and abundant in its range called the silvery blue, the same genus, uh, Glaucosyche, but a different species, Ligdemus. So that raised the question, if Xerxes blue was not in fact its own species, then it wouldn't be extinct. 
So that whole story would need to be revisited. And it raises two larger questions. One is the definition of a species. And then true, statue, sorry, what does it mean to be extinct? So this is where that 2021 paper figures in. In fact, this is the cover of the journal featuring uh, another image of the Xerxes Blue. So th this term here, museomics, so it is a contraction of the two terms, museum and, and genomics. So the goal is to couple museum specimens that contain the DNA of the species, the genomics, and then using that to answer or to address questions that cannot be answered in any other way. So we can't go and do any studies or observations of the species ecology, um, uh, its host plants, its um, the caterpillar stages that aren't preserved, but the DNA can be collected from museum specimens, uh, analyzed and compared to other specimens. So this was the, the objective. So uh, a portion of this, one of the specimens of Xerxes Blue held at the Field Museum in Chicago was collected. So the original specimen was collected in 1928. DNA was extracted from that uh, in their paper. In fact, here we have one of the authors, Dr. Cory Moreau, this is a, a tweet she put out announcing the publication of the paper. Uh, they, they acknowledge that in the 93 years since the specimen was collected, the DNA had degraded. It wasn't of the highest quality, uh, as you'd get from a new species. They were able to use one area of DNA, it's a gene that exists in the mitochondria, for an enzyme called cytochrome oxidase. So they constructed a phylogenetic tree based upon that gene, which allowed them to compare the museum specimen to other specimens that already had that analysis done and it was available in a open access genomic database. So this is the title of their paper, Museum Genomics Reveals the Xerxes Blue Butterfly Was a Distinct Species Driven to Extinction. So, so one thing that jumps straight off the page is that the title to their paper can also be interpreted as the conclusion of their paper. So the, the results are rather difficult to interpret and very small to see. So one of the ways I explain this to students is that essentially what you're doing is this, it's find the differences. So what you're looking for is differences in the gene, in the base sequence of the gene for the species you're studying, compared to other studies. So the rationale is that if you have two specimens of the same species, then the base sequence of the gene is going to be, if not identical, very, very similar. But when you're comparing different species, as the species have been separated for varying amounts of time, the longer the period of separation in thousands or millions of years, the more differences there will be in the two base sequences. So all of the specimens here at top, this is that silvery blue, Glaucosyche lignus. So all of those specimens, the DNA is really, really similar. When we come down here and this area highlighted in a little magenta box, these are the specimens of the Xerxes blue. So it shows that they have a number of differences from the silvery blue. In fact, they're placed here more closely related to another species from the Los Angeles County area, hundreds of miles to the south. So here, Xerxes blue isolates on its own, suggesting it's not a subspecies of the silvery blue and supports their conclusions that it was its own species. Uh, it is related to the silvery blue, the share a common ancestor back here in time, so a sister taxon. Um, and this is also supported by 
observations made in the 1940s by Harry Lang and others that the caterpillar stage, the pattern of spots or maculation in the wings, the host plant, um, all of these things were already different. And the DNA analysis just, just helps clarify that it was its own species. So when I was in the California Academy of Sciences, I, I asked Chris Grinter uh, his opinion. Did he agree with the study? Uh, he didn't agree with the study. The California Academy of Sciences are in the midst of doing their own genomic study. Uh, he thinks it's a much better study. The Field Museum study was of one butterfly. Uh, it was a destructive sample, so they can't go and resample it. They have a bigger collection. They have a better technique. Um, and he raised an interesting question at the end. If it's even possible to define a species. So here, it's a, it's a kind of broader area that um, the biological species definition is a human intellectual construct. It's not something the species themselves abide by or pay much attention to. So it really becomes more of an academic and esoteric point rather than something that's practical to work with in the field. Switching to the California condor. So the California condor, uh, Gymnogyps californianus, is the largest flying bird in North America. The wingspan it's difficult to, to, to get your mind around this. It's 10 feet or 3 meters from wingtip to wingtip. It was one of the first animals listed as an endangered species in the Endangered Species Act of 1973. The species had been in decline for, for some time, certainly perhaps over 100 years, to the point where in 19... 82, the entire population of California condors was down to 22 individuals. It was decided by the, the federal government to capture the remaining wildflying California condors for their own protection and also to establish a, a breeding population to rebuild the species numbers and before eventually uh, released to the wild. So the little clip here at the bottom is the documentation of the capture of the last free-flying condor known as AC9, also known as Igor Higa. So they use um, a carcass as bait. Peter Bloom, in fact here we see condor coming in. Peter Bloom was hiding in a pit when the condor landed. Cannons fired a net, and then his task is to scurry from his scurry from his pit to be able to there you go. Be, be able to secure you know, Igor before either he escaped or perhaps damaged himself. And here you can see that uh, just so once the condors were captured, they were transported to two um, breeding stations. One was Los Angeles Zoo, the other was the Wild Animal Park in San Diego. For scale, that's that's a raven. And then, yeah, packed into a, a portable kennel to be transported to the wild animal park. Also in the background, that is condor country. So that is rugged um, mountain scenery in the Transverse Mountains, north of Santa Barbara. So this is the San Francisco Bay area. And then Northern California, this is the Yurok Territory. So the range of the California condor extended all the way from Baja California, Mexico, um, spotty distribution up the coast, but then also through Oregon, 
Washington State and into British Columbia. And this may be going back hundreds of years, but also the range extended, you go back to fossil records, extended to the Gulf of Mexico. Because so all of those Native American tribes that had California condor in their range had, you know, folklore based upon a variety of different species, but the California condor was a prominent one. It, the sheer size of it, and it, it's it's a vulture, so it would be um, often a portent of doom. So in 2003, tribal elders in Euro territory uh, pioneered an effort to identify the cultural and natural needs to restore or resource restoration and established that the California condor was the number one priority. So they pioneered or they were instrumental in conducting studies, the feasibility studies, um, was there sufficient food, um, quality of habitat that could support condor population. They built the California condor pens and, and the, the monitoring that would, they would require. The Europe Territory includes part of Redwood National Park and in the Grand Canyon and in the Southern California mountains, the California, California condor nest sites are in caves in inaccessible cliffs. But in areas with redwoods, these trees that can get to 50, 60, 70 meters tall, often the uh, the tip of the tree has been damaged with lightning or is dead and there are effectively cavities or caves in the canopy which have been, in fact here, this one from Big Sur, are used as nest sites for the California condor. So the nesting sites were this time in the forest rather than in the cliffs. So this is the title of a paper uh, critically endangered California condors are being reintroduced to the Redwood National Park for the first time in 100 years. So that, this was a newspaper article. So since 1992, a lot has been learned in the best ways to, to reintroduce wild condors uh, from captive populations. So now... Rather than releasing juvenile condors on their own, they often um, place the juvenile condors with an adult condor. This one, that was the number was 746, um, served as a mentor to, to model behavior for the, the, the juveniles. So the, the goal is to release four to six condors every year for the next 20 years to, to build up a population. And for, for any reintroduction program for a species that has been to the brink of extinction, and there's so few individuals that make up the founding population, is the risk of inbreeding. So once again, they return to museomics, to go and study the genetic diversity of condors from that region. So there's no living condors for 100 years, but from museum specimens. And then decide which assemblage of different juvenile individuals to, to place together for the release to build that population in Northern California. So this population would be hundreds of miles away from Ventura County population, Central California, uh, Grand Canyon is over here somewhere. So unique genetic population. So I have a little video clip here that comes from the Europe Tribe Reinduction Program. Um, it's narrated by scientists involved with the release. So. On May 3rd, 2022, two juvenile males were released. Um, they were given Yurok names. Nesque Chok, which translates to he returns. Following the release, he, he stayed in the vicinity. 
In fact, he has uh, a tree that he prefers to sleep in that's close enough that he can stay in contact with the other juvenile still in the pen and the adult mentor 746. The other one, uh, Poi with Sun, the one who goes away, <laughs> after his release, they didn't see him for two whole weeks. But both regularly come back to be fed. Um, carcasses are provided outside the cage. On May 25th, um, the first juvenile female was released when the two previously released males were at the pen. California condors are are a social species. So having the ability for them to forage on their own but come back, that is hopefully going to be a successful model for the Europe release. And the next cohort of condors, two males uh, from Oregon Zoo, uh, another male and female from the World Center for Birds of Prey. So they're going to be released later this year. So the video clip here, it's about two, two and a half minutes long, that talks through the, the process uh, leading to the release. Wildlife departments. So Tiana Williams-Clausen, and the narrator there herself, she is a Yurok. So I can't imagine what it must have felt like to, to pull the lever and let the condors out for the first time in a hundred years. So that is a success story. The California condor um, is not extinct. In fact, it's free flying. The population is the highest now. It's been for perhaps over a hundred years. So this is something that I had not known until I started doing my research, that there was an extinction during the recovery program. So this is known as co-extinction. When one species goes extinct, another species, depending upon it, also goes extinct. So this was inadvertent. So as they captured the last free-flying California condors, took them into the facilities for their uh, preservation 
and for the recovery, part of the process was to um, de-louse them, so treat them against parasites. But in the process, one species of avian chewing louse that lived exclusively on California condor, a Colpocephalum californici, was driven to extinction. So when the world's remaining condors were rounded up in 97 and sent to recovering breeding centers, the birds were created for parasites, and this species of louse became extinct. You look at this, it was only discovered in 1963 and was extinct in 1987. So the last, um, Calcocephalum californiciae, vanished from the earth in a puff of carburyl powder fumigation. So, as I said, that a lot of things have been learned from the California Recovery Program. So that in future, when an endangered species is taken in to captivity for captive breeding, there will be an effort taken to preserve all of the associated species, including the parasites. That there, there is a belief that um, parasites do play an important ecological role. And if the California condor feather louse was around, that may have become um, preferable to any parasite, any louse they pick up from other wild birds that didn't evolve with California condors that could, co could, could cause more problems than the one that had evolved with California condors over millions of years. Now, the last part of the story, uh, this refers to the Xerxes blue that we started with, is the, this concept of de-extinction. So here, um, the banner is from a conference uh, sponsored by TED Talks on de-extinction from 2013. And the goal of de-extinction could be summarized as the attempt to resurrect extinct species by a combination of genetic engineering and habitat conservation. And the bottom image here you may recognize as a clip from Jurassic Park. So that was science fiction. Uh, currently, the extinction is walking the line between science fiction and science fact. If you have stored DNA of high quality that could be used, um, uh, ideally an intact genome with all of the genes present, that could be used to use genetic engineering to splice in some genes from the extinct species into uh, a living closely related species to make some form of genetic hybrid. So this paper Reintroduction, Resurrected Species, Selecting De-Extinction Candidates. So this listed Xerxes Blue as a candidate species. And to be a candidate species, you had to have you know, some, ex some ability to survive in the current environment. So you introduced to a functioning ecosystem. So with restoration efforts in the Presidio of San Francisco, that would be true. The extinct species would have to have an ecological role it could fill. Um, uh, so as such, there are no species that have been de-extincted. It's an area of controversy in conservation biology. And uh, some of the concerns is that if the public perception was that Extinction is no, no longer a big issue because we can simply flick a switch and de-extinct something. Then there's less need to invest the time and resources to preserve endangered species. Also a concern is that it could be used by corporations that would otherwise not be allowed to, I don't know, develop a project or to um, destroy a species habitat if they promise to pay for the extinction. So here the concern would be that 
it the race is like a false hope um, for for species that are endangered that we could just magically fix them using technology. Uh, currently, the technology is not there. The it's a pipe dream, and at best, it could only be a supplement to actual conservation because the habitat would need to be intact before a de-extinct species could be introduced. The habitat's gone, this would not work either. So, so thank you folks. So to extinction and beyond, the stories of the Xerxes blue and the California condor. It has been a pleasure.